I'm going to start off with a brief introduction of our farm, and then I'm going to do some, just some seed basics uh, of some of the key things that you really should know about seed saving. And then I'm going to talk a bit about how seed production fits into our market garden. And then I'm going to jump into a bunch of numbers and talk more about running a seed business and kind of looking at, you know, retail business versus a wholesale business. And um, we'll see whether there's time or not um, at the end. Um, so, yeah, maybe if you want to give me a heads up at some point, like maybe 10 minutes before, because I don't see a clock or anything. And uh, great. Okay. So... Um, uh, I'm part of a Tournesol cooperative farm, La Ferme Cooperative Tournesol. Tournesol is French for sunflower, kind of like girasol, and um, it's a play on words. Um, Tournesol itself means kind of turn towards the sun, but because there's a hyphen in it, it also means turning the soil. And um, we're a, a farmer run by five people. We're a worker co-op, uh, so the five of us run this. Uh, you know, each person has one vote independent of, of shares that they, that they own. Um, and we've been farming together for about 11 years at this point. Uh, we also have a staff. Uh, last year we had five people on staff in the summer. This year we're going to have seven, so our operation is about 12 people. We are based about 45 minutes to the west of Montreal. Um, we have about, we rent about 17 acres. There's about 13 acres that's cropped, and on that 13 acres, about seven acres is in cash crop of one type or another. Where I'm also the co-author of Crop Planning for Organic Vegetable Growers, and I'll be talking about crop planning on Saturday in a session, and I'll be alluding to some of, some of the tools that we use to an analyze vegetable profitability we'll be using in a sort of a seed context in, in this workshop. Um, so predominantly we're vegetable growers. About three quarters of our income comes from vegetables. We grow a lot of staples and some of the weird stuff, but, but mostly staples. About one eighth is, uh, is, is garlic. And another eighth is seed production. This is a Mizuna uh, field gone to seed. Um, um, most of our vegetables are sold through a farmer's market. Or actually, that's not true. About 40% through a farmer's market, and the rest is through a 350 CSA, 350 member CSA uh, vegetable basket program. Um, so before, so that's who we are. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go through two crops and just kind of show you what it looks like to produce seed and also what it looks like to produce seed on the, on the scale that we're at. Uh, so first is tomatoes, um, which is a wet seeded crop. And um, so we harvest tomatoes when they're quite ripe and then we squish them. You could do this with your hand or with a spoon, but uh, we're processing pounds and pounds of our largest lot so far has been like 800 pounds of tomato seeds squashed, squished at one point. Um, to get about four pounds of, of seed out of there. Um, uh, so you can see in the back is all the tomatoes we're going to be processing. Once it's squished, um, oh, there's missing a screen. We'll screen, out the, um, we'll screen out the pulp, and then we put it into a garbage pail, and we then ferment it in the garbage pail for three or four days. And then afterwards, we fill it up with water um, to let the heavier seed sink, and uh, the rest of the stuff floats to the top. And then we'll pour it off to decant it. And I'm missing some slides. Okay, we'll work that out. And then so at the bottom of this, there is, um, there is, you know, the seeds there. We'll pour it out into trays like this, and then we have a system of fans to dry it. And so with this, we're producing seed lots that, you know, that are ranging from somewhere like a quarter pound to four pounds in size. And that's a lot of tomato seed. It's way more tomato seed than a vegetable farm like us uses and way more than we can sell through our own seed companies. So tomato seed is something that we sell to a number of other seed companies. So we sell to about a dozen seed companies. Um, a different crop, uh, go back to the Mizuna, this is a dry seeded crop. Um, so Will, one second here. Okay, Will, um, we, we harvest it when it's, when it, when it's, when it's brown, when the, when the pods start to dry down, and then we'll thresh it on a tarp and um, we use simple, simple screens and bins to, to clean it, and then we'll use a, uh, we'll winnow it um, with the wind to just get rid of any chaff out of it. And with that technology, we can get the seed pretty clean. And we're doing lots up to about 25 pounds of Nebraska green with this. And whereas with a tomato seed, most of what we're doing is being sold, like the bulk of the, vo the volume of the tomato seed that we're selling is selling to other seed companies the, with, um, with Nebraska Green, we do sell some to other seed companies, but we also do sell a lot as bulk formats to farmers and gardeners. And then we also use a certain amount on our own farm. Um, 
And then so we have an online seed catalog and a print catalog that we sell seed through. Um, we also have seed racks. And um, across Canada, there's these events called City Saturdays and City Sundays. They're kind of like a farmer's market. It's like a one-shot one event. And it's kind of like a farmer's market, but it's a bunch of seed vendors who go there. And people go and they purchase seed from different growers. And then there's also usually a seed swap, and there's usually a different educational sessions. Um, so this is something there's... I don't know, I don't, I mean, there might be a hundred across Canada, and we go to about a dozen. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, revenue source. Um, in addition to that, as I mentioned, we sell seed to about a dozen other seed companies that then they'll resell it as, uh, as packets. Um, so some basics. Um, and there are a number of really good seed books out there. Um, these are three that, um, that I'd recommend. The organic seed grower specifically is kind of a higher level um, uh, of information. The other two are more a little bit more basic, um, and I think at least the first two are in the bookstore if you're if you're looking for those th those for that kind of information. So the first thing it's going to be aware of is what crosses with what. So it's one of the challenges a seed producer is making sure things are true to type and they stay true. Um, so to know that, and you'll s the next couple slides there are bilingual in French and in English. You guys can follow in the language you choose, um, and so. You know, in the plant world, you got different families, like Cucurbitaceae is the squash family, and then there's different genuses, so Cucumis, and then different species, in this case, Cucumis melo. Anybody know what species that is? That's the melon species. And then you have different cultivars, so honeydew melon, Charente melons, the Montreal melon, which is popular back home, um, cantaloupes. Um, they're all the same species, so if you grow two of these side by side, there is a chance, a likelihood, that they're going to cross-pollinate and you can get some of the traits of each parent in the offspring. And that's something that you want to avoid as a, well, if you're looking to grow a specific variety, you want it to be true to type. And if you're going to sell the seed, you really want it to be true to type. Um, or else you're just selling for one season. And then you have another, so another Cucubidaceae, um, Cucumis sativus, is a different species, and that's cucumbers. And so there's different varieties of cucumbers and any of the varieties of cucumbers within themselves can cross-pollinate. But if you have one melon beside a cucumber, they won't cross-pollinate because they're different species. And in the plant world, that's generally true that two species won't cross. It's not 100% true, but we're going to treat it like it is. Um, and um, so that's the information that you need to know when you're going to figure out what crosses with, 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 with each other. And most seed catalogs will be able to tell you that the scientific name, um, different sources. It's important to also realize that those names change over time. So it's possible that you have two names that are different, but they're actually the same species, just that one's an older, um, I guess, standard, and one's a new uh, name. So does that make sense? So we'll test you guys. We're going to play a game called the crossing game. <laughs> I'll put up two crops. Onions and leeks, do these guys cross-pollinate? Yeah. yeah, there's some yes, some no. Well, a lot of quiet. Come on, yes or no? No. 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 Okay, so, and how would you know? So they are different species. So one is Allium sepa, the other one is Allium apoloprasum. Um, how about onions and bunching onions? Would those guys cross? Yes. yes. Put up your hands, you yesers. Anyone serious no? So it depends. <laughs> um, bulb onions or Allium sepa. Bunching onions, little the green onions, sometimes they're Allium sepa, an immature bulb onion, and sometimes they're a, a separate species. The ones like the evergreen, which doesn't bulb up, um, kind of a perennial green onion. These guys um, are a different species, so they won't cross. So it depends. How about kale and Swiss chard? No. Anybody say yes? They are both fantastic with garlic and fried up. <laughs> so they're a different species, they're different genius, and they're different family. So it'd be exceptional that they cross. How about Swiss chard and beets? Yeah? Any uh, doubters? So these are the same, the same species. And this is a good example of how people have chosen for different parts of the plant to, to, to select for different features, and it's changed over time. Broccoli and kale. Yes. Okay. It's again, it depends. Broccoli is Brascola raceae. Some kales are Brascola raceae, like the green curly kales, the last natodinosaur kales. 
Brask the, but then like the Russian kales, the Siberian kales are Brassica napis. So the napis won't cross with the Oleraceae. Um, and there's actually a lot of different brassica species. And I'm not going to go through them all by, one by one, but there's a whole bunch of European brassicas, the Asian brassicas, the spicy brassicas, and some of the brassicas that are kind of in the middle. Um, and there, you can grow one of each of these species side by side, and they won't cross-pollinate. But if you were to grow two of these guys, you will get a cross. All right, how about a, a, a Charente melon? So that's kind of a French melon, kind of like a cantaloupe um, with a watermelon. Will these guys cross? These are very different species. And last up, what about a zucchini and a pumpkin? Yes. Yes? Anybody, anybody doubting this? So this is a big it depends. <laughs> there are three main species of squash that are used. Um, there are some other ones too, but there's three main. And pumpkin, so most zucchini falls in Cucubita pepo. Almost all of it's in Cucubita pepo. But if it's a pie pumpkin, that's a pepo. Some of those really giant pumpkins, like a rouge vif d'etat, um, or those, like those, those Dills Atlantic giants, those are maximas. So different, different species won't cross if they're side by side. But if you had like a zucchini, a delicata, a patty pan, an acorn, or like a pie pumpkin, those guys will all cross up. And um, so, it's, so species really makes a difference. Another concept I just want to mention is, um, you know, how do the crops pollinate? So there are a group of crops that predominantly self-pollinate, and we call those selfers. And a group of crops that predominantly cross-pollinate, and those we call them crossers. And what's important to know is that selfers sometimes cross, and that crossers sometimes self. But, um, but usually you can treat them as two different groups. And, and they're really... The way you manage them is very different one from the other. Um, with selfers, you don't have to worry about cross-pollination much. And because the, um, well, I guess the reason there are these, these groups is that plants, like animals, can suffer from inbreeding depression. So if there's two individuals that are too closely related, there will be deleterious genes that appear, and you're going to have problems. Now, so that's why most plants cross-pollinate to avoid this inbreeding depression. And they have all kinds of strategies to do that. There's a subset of plants that have adapted to being able to self-pollinate and not suffer from inbreeding depression. And these are referred to as selfers. So these are the easiest crops to grow. And you can get away with really small populations. You can have, you know, 1 to 16 plants, and you can probably maintain a good population or at least an average population, for a number of years without suffering any problems. You can grow small, um, so small isolation distances. Most selfers, if you grow them so side by side, you'll see 1 or 2% crossing, maybe 5%. If you go to 50%, 50 feet uh, distance, you see next to nothing. And when you're at two or 300 feet, you'll, there'll really be no crossing. Um, so it makes them very easy to grow. Now, if you are growing seed commercially, you want this number to be higher just because you really have to cover your bases. But if you're growing seed for your own use, you can go small on this, and you probably won't, won't have a problem. Um, they stabilize quite quickly. If you wind up finding a cross that you like, you can select out of it, and in five or six generations, you should have something that's fairly stable. And there's not a lot of crops that are like this. Tomatoes, beans, peas, lettuce, peppers, eggplants are some of the may, main uh, selfers. There's also, um, like, wheat and oats are also selfers. The majority of crops are crossers. And um, um, so if you're new to seed saving, this is the stuff that you really want to look at. Um, getting into is a little more advanced. So you need larger populations to maintain the genetic integri integrity of the population. Um, you need larger isolation distances. I have 600 feet and more. For some crops, 600 feet is adequate. On farm use, it might be adequate. For sale, the only way to know that it's adequate is if you grow the seed out the next year and you see that it hasn't crossed up. So you probably want to be going closer to like half a mile um, to really be sure for, for, on, on farm, for, for sale. Also, if there is a cross that happens in your population, it's your population changes very easily. It just wants to change, um, which can be really exciting if you're looking for new things, but it can be very frustrating if you're trying to keep the same thing. And most crops are crossers. So 
you have to have a strategy of how things are not going to cross-pollinate if you're dealing with, with crossers. And in some cases, you know, if you're, bringing, if you're growing cauliflower seed and you're in an area where there's nobody else doing brassica seeds, you probably don't have to worry about it because it's just going to be by itself. But if you were doing squash, most squash, you know, other people might have squash, you might have five or six varieties in your field, and then it becomes, becomes a concern. Now, there's one exception to some of these numbers, and that's cucurbits, so the squash family. Um, they do cross, they really cross quite a bit, but they tolerate inbreeding depression quite a bit, so you can have small population numbers and not worry about it. Um, so, yeah, so, I, um, so what crosses with each other? Selfers versus crossers. And the last point of just of the seed basics is annuals versus biennials. And this is for the seed production part. So an annual is a crop that produces seed. You, you sow it, it goes plus the plant, produces flower, you get seed, the plant dies. A biennial produces a, a vegetable the first year, a root or a floret. You have to overwinter it, which in this kind of climate is probably a lot easier than at our home, than back home where we have a foot of snow right now and a lot of ice. Um, and then the second year, it produces seed, and then it dies back. And um, so there's more things to, to, to go into to overwintering it. And so some biennials, like kale, chard, parsley, uh, most of the brassicas, um, chicories are biennials. Onions, leeks, a lot of root crops are biennials. So these guys have to have a first year and then a second year. And one thing with crops like all these root crops, maybe that onions and leeks, you kind of see the actual root, is... Or I guess, so in all the cases when you're saving seed, you always want to be selecting the best plants to be the mothers of the next generation. And with roots, that means taking it out of the ground, visually inspecting it, and putting it back in the ground. Um, in our climate, this is obvious because we can't overwinter carrots in the ground, so we have to look at each one. But if you're in a cl climate that has a mild winter and you can overwinter carrots in the, in, in the field, you still should dig them out, look at them, and put them back in. And this is a really important part to both maintain your variety and improve your varieties. So, um, so we're a vegetable farm, and we grow a lot of different vegetables. And, um, and I'll talk a bit about what that means, having a seed company on our vegetable farm. And you know, the first thing is that you know, we grow 60 plus different types of vegetables. Um, we've tried hundreds, if not thousands of varieties. And we rely on good vegetable varieties. So we have a good idea what a good vegetable variety is. And in some cases, we also have an idea what's a good vegetable variety for a farmer versus for a home gardener, which is not, the, it's not all the same varieties. Um, like these red tomatoes that we have at our farmer's market, um, I can't tell the variety differently here, but they're most likely hybrid tomatoes. And about 90% of the tomatoes that we grow as commercial crop to sell at market are hybrid, are hybrid tomatoes. And we do that because they store and handle so much better. And we need them to get to market. Now, they taste good. We like the taste of these tomatoes. But, when we do it, but, but we also grow a lot of heirloom tomato seed that we sell to gardeners. And when we taste those heirloom tomatoes, on, on average, they are way tastier than the, heir, than the hybrids we have. Um, but they have thinner skins. They don't pack out as well. Sometimes they're more susceptible to some diseases. And as a market gardener, we can't rely on that kind of variety. Um, though taste, there has to be, it has to still be taste good before you can sell it. But, um, but as a home gardener, you can. You can have the best tasting tomatoes because you can handle them much better. So as a, as, as a market gardener, it kind of gives us an understanding of, uh, uh, of how to deal with varieties. What's also good, what's my next slide? Yeah, so... Um, I'll just talk about how a crop can integrate as a seed crop and also as a market crop. So this is a cross that we've been working with for a number of years. And we've been started off with a tatsoi, kind of like a little bok choy, and we've crossed in some purple-leaved brassicas, and we've been selecting for a purple tatsoi or bok choy with pink stems in it. And we're pretty close on that. But often when we seed it out, there's still some green ones that come out. You know? So we'll seed it in the greenhouse, we take out the green ones and plant the ones that are closer to what we like. And, you know, we choose the best plants when they go in the field. And so here's a field, and there's different populations coming from different mother plants. And so this is a breeding project. Most seed saving wouldn't look like this, but in the case of a breeding project, you're trying to, 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 to get towards the best stuff, or whatever, whatever the best stuff is. And so here, you can see there's a lot of diversity in the different plants. And 
we're looking for something like this, a little too green in the middle, but you know, if it was in the winter, it'd probably be perfectly purple. Here's one that's a little more purple, though I think it's a, too, a little too ruffled in the middle. And then this one is not a winner. And so what we can do as a market grower is at different stages, we can, like at a younger stage, we can cut, get a first cut and use it as a salad mix. Um, we can have it as a braising mix also. So we can get a couple cuts that can generate revenue on their own and then still get seed off of that. But as a breeding project, we can also cut out the plants that we don't like, put an elastic on them, and sell them as a bok choy. And so it's paying for the rest of the work that we're doing in there. And then what comes through at the end um, will be the seed that we want. And this is something, so you know, with lettuces, um, a, a lot of leafy greens, you can do this kind of th thing. If you're dealing with kale or chard, you can get cuts off of the fall and then over winter and get seed the next year. It's kind of hard to eat your carrot and save the seed from it too. But if you are growing a lot of carrots and you have 2,000 carrots and you choose the best 100 carrots to grow out for seed, you're going to have a much better variety the next year than if you just grew 100 carrots and saved seed from all of that. So being a market grower lets you have a lot of plants to choose from, and you can sell the rest, I mean, as long as they're decent looking. Um, and so having this, having, having, um, yeah, um, so having this vegetable business has, has given us a good opportunity to jump into seed. And now, we also have, so we have 350 families that pick up vegetables from us, from our CSA. We also go to farmer's market. So maybe there's like five to 600 families that are dealing with us on a weekly basis. Many of them have gardens. So a seed business piggybacks really nicely onto a business that you already have clients. So we love to sell client seed to anybody, but it's really nice that people that already love us for all kinds of other reasons to then come and want to get seed from us. Um, and then we also sell transplants in the spring, so that piggybacks also really well um, in it. And um, now, I'm going to go through a lot of seed slides, and just to give you a sneak peek, a spoiler, seed, growing seeds and selling seeds is both profitable on a wholesale level and a retail level. Um, if it wasn't, I probably wouldn't be here telling you about it. But it's, it's a lot of work to do it, and it's a business that takes a longer time to develop than a vegetable business. If you have great vegetables and you go to a farmer's market, maybe nobody knows you being in the season, but by mid-season, by the end of the season, people will know who you are if your product is great and if you're at least half friendly. Um, but with a seed company, you know, it takes a lot of time and you have to build relationships and you've got to become profitable. And so at mar farmer's market, you have every week to interact with a client. If, you have, if somebody buys something from you and there's a worm in it or they don't like the flavor and they come back the next week and they tell you, you can give them something back. You can explain, you know, you can make amends and, you, and often that can make a, a more solid relationship with the client. With the seed company, if you order seeds from me in February and I sell you something and that summer you grow it out and it doesn't germinate or it doesn't cross, or it's, or it's all crossed up, I, I, and if you, don't come and, if you don't come and see me or talk to me about it, I'll never know about it. And if you decide not to buy seeds because of this, then that's, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's just burnt, that, that bridge. So it takes a lot longer for people to get trust with, uh, with seeds. And usually, usually folks will buy a few varieties from you one year. And then, and then if they love your stuff, they'll come by and a bit, buy a bit more. And, you know, after three or four years, they might be buying most of the seeds from you. But it takes, that's three or four years to build that relationship, whereas over a, a season at a farmer's market, you can, um, you can really get some solid, loyal, loyal clients. And, and as a consequence, um, it's hard to really ramp up your sales quick. And uh, there's definitely a direct correlation with volume to become profitable in, uh, in seeds. Um, it's true in a lot of things, but you need to get a certain scale. So it, it takes time. And having a vegetable business is really great because, you know, with 350 CSA shares, the farmer's market, we're able to pay ourselves, we're able to maintain a profitable business, so we're not stressed out trying to grow the seed business. And the seed business is growing, despite us doing very little marketing on it, because we have a good product, and we have, most of the time, good customer service. We try to respond to emails, um, but, but 
you know, it's been growing at 20 to 50% over the last like four or five years, and that's with little, very, little, very little help. Um, but we can afford to grow, that might be quick in some schemes, but still slowly when you're starting with low numbers, you can afford to grow slowly if you have something else that's paying the bills. And then once you have your systems worked out, then you can really push and go crazy. Um, so I would definitely recommend being cautious with an endeavor like this. Cautious to be, good to be cautious in any case, but with a, with a seed business, it's good to be cautious. Um, and one last, one last thing that I'll, I'll, I'll highlight, well, it's not one last thing, it's one thing I'll highlight as I transition to more numbers, is um, you, know, you can sell products, you can sell service. And to a certain extent, we're all selling services. If I'm selling you a basket of fresh, fresh vegetables, you know, I'm selling you a farm experience, I'm selling you the promise of health and all that, but you're, I'm still selling you vegetables. And the amount of money that I make is a correlation with how much we can harvest. And even when you streamline and choose your most profitable crops, you are still restricted by the physical labor that you can do. Whereas if you have a service that is not have a direct part with the, with the physical product, um, you can sit, sell a lot more and it's, you can make a lot more profit for the same amount of work because it's not tied to your physical work. And to a certain extent, growing seed starts to move over to that service. Now, if you're selling seed as a bulk to a seed company that then resells it, you're definitely dealing with the profit. You're definitely dealing with the product. But when you're selling a pinch of seed in an envelope, that's much closer to a service. And so there's a potential profitability that's huge. And I would highlight the potential. Uh, it's, not, it's not automatic. Um, and, but I'd also highlight it's still linked to a physical product. And that kind of um, does, you know, ultimately it's, the potential's greater, but it's still gonna be work to get there. And uh, so we'll see what that looks like. So you can sell seed a few different ways. But sort of the two extremes, one would be selling seed wholesale and generally be selling that to other seed companies that then pack it into little packs and then sell it out. Um, or you can sell seed retail and that might be through an online web system. Um, it could also be through seed racks. Um, you can be, do it at farmer's markets or CD Saturdays. Um, but in that case, you're getting most of the retail dollar off of the small packet. And you can do something in between where you're selling you know, small packets but also selling like quarter pounds or pounds. And I'm not going to get into that. Um, but it's also a really great niche because so few people are doing that on a small seed scale. So I'll start off by talking about the wholesale, and that's growing bulk seeds. And um, I'll just look at, well, this is a tool that we use for our vegetables, kind of some profitability and space benchmarks. And I'm just going to highlight that I'm using an imperial system and a metric system together, and um, I'm just going to do it. <laughs> I find that metric systems for weights work so much better than dealing with ounces and pounds. It's really easy to, to break things up. But imperial units are, thinking of in feet for distance is so much easier than thinking in meters um, to kind of relate to it. So um, I'll also highlight that, you know, I'm gonna you can talk about dollars per acre, but very few of us are growing an acre of any kind of crop. So we break that down to dollars per bed foot. And a bed foot is if you take a growing bed and you take a slice that's one foot long, um, that's a bed foot. And you might have you know, three lettuce heads in that, or you might have one tomato plant in that. Um, so if you can make 750 off of a bed foot, that's the same thing as about $60,000 an acre. And this is on a five foot spacing from your middle of one path to the middle of the next path. Um, making $40,000 an acre, it's $5 a bed foot, and you can see the math down. And um, in general, for a crop, you know, you want crops that are at the 40,000 and higher if you're working on a small scale. And um, the more scale, you, the more acreage you have, the lower you can go down. The less acreage you have, the higher you want to go up. And then you can also stack multiple crops one on top of the other to get multiple $40,000 an acre. So what does that look like? So if you have a lettuce head, you grow, you have a bed 300 foot long with three rows of lettuce, that's 900 heads you can harvest out of 300 bed feet. If you sell them 250 a head, that's about 750 a bed feet. So that's um, that's that $60,000 an acre. Of course, you might not sell all 900 heads. You know, they can bolt. You might have deer. You might have groundhogs. You can have all kinds of things that happen. So you're probably at least at the $40,000 with something like lettuce. Um, so for seeds, 
if you have a brassica green and you can get about three kilograms out of 75 bed feet and you're selling at about $40 for almost a pound, that comes about $4 a bed foot. So just under $40,000 an acre, um, which on a medium-sized farm, that's probably a profitable crop. Now, of course, if you put it in a packet and you put a, only four grams in a packet at $3, selling at $30 a bed foot, which if you go back to that sheet here, $30 a bed foot is four times over here. It's about $240,000 an acre, which is fantastic. Um, but selling in packets has a lot of other costs, and we'll talk about that after. So um, I've got a sheet here, and I, I'm probably gonna, I have a blog, so I'll probably get this on the blog, because I don't have any, any way to hand it out to you. But, you know, if you haven't, this is, this, is, this is on, I think, an eighth of an acre or a quarter of an acre. You know, a bunch of different crops you could grow in our bioregion, different bed feet you might grow, and then what they might be worth um, per, per pound. And so off of about, I think it's an eighth of an acre, um, well, 1,100 uh, feet, bed feet, I'm not going to do the math, um, you can probably get about $4,400 of bulk seed off of that. And, um, and so we'll just look at that over here. So if you have beans, and you're getting 80 grams of bed foot, and you get about $10 a pound, that's about a buck 78 a bed foot, which is not fantastic. It only makes sense if you have enough area to dedicate it to it to, 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 to do that. Now, one thing you could do is you can raise your price. And raising your price, it increases your profitability quite a bit. You could also change varieties that you're growing or growing practices to increase your yield, and that can also raise your profitability. You can do both of those things. Um, so raising your price, improving your, your growing productions has a big impact. And suddenly, you're getting close to that $40,000 an acre. And that makes that crop sold at a bulk level worthwhile. You have to have buyers for beans at 15 bucks a pound. And that's not all companies that would buy that from you. Um, but maybe a pole bean, they might be interested, or something that's more rare. So knowing what, you know, sort of the, the, the rareness or uniqueness of your variety has an impact. Now, one thing, if you can increase your, if this was profitable and you increase your yield, you could also reduce your price and now you're back at a lower amount. But if this is a profitable amount for you, reducing your price is a way that you can sell a lot more stuff. And if you can, incre if you can sell 10 times more stuff or 100 times more stuff, it might make sense to do that. But um, now this is just a benchmark. It has no correlation with what your expenses are. And we'll talk a bit about that more on the crop planning session on Saturday. Um, so you've got to know what your crop production expenses are. Um, so if this is not profitable for you, there's no reason to be doing that. Does that all make sense, kind of these numbers? Um, but now, I would highlight that beans are on the lower side of profitability. And it's hard, you know, there's a lot of companies that are paying five to eight bucks to get beans. And if you're buying beans in the grocery store, you know, organic even, you're not paying 15 bucks of beans, or very, very rarely. Um, so that might, might be the kind of crop that you want to specialize into. But most other crops, you can be quite profitable on. So calculating the labor involved in collecting the seed, you know, it's a lot easier, you know, having beans dry on and, and you know, collecting them versus, you know, some other crops that are a lot more labor intensive. Um, collecting the seed part. Well, I would say that, that I'm not going to go into time. Um, there's, it's, it's very interesting. So, what, so what, I would, what I would say in kind of conclusion with, with the bulk space is that most seed crops compare very favorably with vegetable crops sold at direct marketing prices. So something in that forty to $50,000 an acre. Beans are really on the lower edge. And um, some seed crops can be much, much higher, especially if you can get a good, a good price per pound off of them. They might be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's at the bulk price. Now, for time, the reason I don't talk a lot about time is that time really depends on how much skill you have. And that's true with vegetables growing, but you can be a slow harvester for, 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 for some crops and still make money. Whereas with seeds, if you're a slow harvester, you're not going to be making seed money. And it can be painful, pain, the learning steps that you have to go through with seeds. But once you know what you're doing, the profitability in time for seeds is very high. 
Um, and it's at least comparable to vegetables. Even beans would be compared to vegetables, but stuff like the brassica greens can be a lot higher than that. Tomatoes can be a lot higher than that. So, um, so I would just add that as a sort of an addendum, but, I'm, but I, I won't go a lot into that. Um, and I'll tell you, harvesting beans for seed that are being sold at 15 bucks a pound is way faster than harvesting bean, beans as bean pods that you're selling fresh at market. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, I did talk about getting cuts of salad greens and then getting seed from it. That doesn't work in a case like beans or peas. Well, peas, it's a bit different, but beans, if you pick the beans off of your plants, some will grow back, but you'll really have an impact on the volume of seed you can get off of it. And so it's, you're, you're, you have to grow extra beans to do it, and it kind of it defeats the purpose. <laughs> some pole peas, I found you can get a couple, couple pickings off of it, and then you can get a really fantastic harvest. And sometimes a seed crop will pay for the, pay for the space and time it's taking, and then getting peas off of it in addition is just a bonus. And, um, you know, peas also are quite a bit of work to pick. So um, people like having at market. It's nice to have them in CSA. It doesn't bring a lot of money to you. So it's good to have some other way to make them make money. So I'll go through selling seeds at direct marketing prices now. And um, so um, I'm not going to get on some... So this is the same crops as before. And um, what I would just highlight, so it's breaking them down into a smaller packet... The dollars per acre that you see here are between $70,000 and $700,000 an acre. And that's for amaranth, a really popular seed. Um, but you can see that you know, if you were to, 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 to repack this $4,000 or $5,000 of seeds into small packets, you could easily get $45,000 of product to sell. So almost 10 times more on average. Um, which sounds fantastic. Who wouldn't want to turn $5,000 into $45,000? Um, I mean, we have a seed business. <laughs> um, now, so on a wholesale level, you're kind of at $13,000 to $100,000 in the previous charts. You're dealing with a couple clients. Direct market, you know, $70,000 to $1.3 million an acre. I don't what was Which one was that? That was the tomatoes, yeah. That's fantastic. Um, that's 15,000 packets that you have to sell. So it's a lot more product that you're working through. And so the, I'm going to go through some budget slides. And they're, they're, more, they're not our direct budget, but they're kind of inspired by our budget. And you'll see that that creates a whole new business if you want to be selling seed retail. Um, so some of the considerations. The first thing is your packet. <laughs> And so this is a pack. This is not our first packet that we had, but we had it after a couple iterations. You know, so it's just a craft envelope with a couple. You know, we print out our, our I mean, we'll print, print, print labels and then stick them on. Um, uh, and it worked. You know, when we got to that, we thought it was really slick looking. Um, the, our current packets, you know, are pre, are, you know, they look better. We print directly on them. We're probably going to be moving into stuff with color pictures on it. So you have to think about what your actual marketing is. And, um, you know, the more packets you want to sell, the, the more the packet look probably has an impact. Um, though you also don't want to alienate your customer base if you're trying to look down home and farming. Um, so, and you also think about how you get the seed into the packet. And um, uh, we have a fantastic staff. Um, and, uh, yeah, so this is something that, I mean, with her doing it, it'll take you forever. But even with ourselves, it's still a job that takes quite a bit of time. Um, and, you know, our, when we're packing fast, we can be packing two to 300 packets an hour, depending on the type of seed. But that's not always the case. And, and I think if you don't have your systems down, and if you are doing a lot of sticking of labels and that kind of stuff, you might only be doing 50 packets an hour when you average everything out, all the different steps. So it's, it's something to be considerate to consider the work that that actually goes into making the product that you're going to be selling. And, and this is why looking at that 1.3 million per acre really is not where you should end the equation. You've got to look at how you transform it afterwards. So, um, yeah, so if you have your packet, you need to think about the seed that's going to be in it. And in this case, I've taken the $4,400 of seed that was generated on a bulk business, uh, from the bulk uh, sales. And I guess... I would, I would highlight that we look at our seed business from sort of two angles. We have a bulk seed business on the farm that sells some seed to other seed companies and sells some seed to our retail seed business. And then so 
the numbers I'm looking at here don't really have any consideration of how much time is spent weeding. All of that is embodied in that $4,400. So we're hoping that the bulk seed business is, gener is profitable on its own, and then it sells seed to the retail business, which is profitable on its own also. Now, I mean, ultimately, you could have a non an unprofitable bulk business that's subsidized if you have a really profitable packet business. But it is good to have both of them profitable. Um, you have to have the cost of actual packing the seed. And then something that people don't always think about is you need to do germination tests. You have to make sure that your seed is germinating. And, um, uh, and, and that takes time. And it's, so I put 15 minutes per lot. And that's, not, that's, that's, you know, you're checking a couple times over a 10-day period. So that adds up. Also, if you are not good at germination tests and things don't germinate, but you're pretty sure the seed is good and you want to do another round of germination tests, that's more time that goes into it. Um, but if you don't have a germination test, so I guess to get away from a germination test, one of the things that made it, I felt really confident growing seed is some of the first seed we grew was, was, was like arugula and tatsoi. And we did a lot of salad greens at that point. So we'd harvest the, the arugula or tatsoi seed in early, early August. Once it was cleaned, we would start planting it in mid-August, and we planted for the next 10 weeks until, or next five weeks until mid-September, and we'd be, see them germinate, we'd see that they were not cross-pollinated, and we'd be harvesting crop off of it. And so we might be looking at 100,000 seeds, that, or 10,000 seeds that were in the ground. And with seed like that, I'll stu do, still do a germ test to have an official number, but I feel pretty confident that it's fine. But if I'm to get zucchini seed, and I, you know, if you get zucchini seed in September, you're not going to know that it's good until the next time you plant it. And you're going to have a selling season before then. So the germ test is really the only way to know, short of growing something in the field, which becomes its own germ test. And um, this is something that makes a big difference with clients. You know, sure, your packaging is great, your customer service is important, but when they grow it, if things don't germinate, um, well, what's nice about, what's nice? <laughs> What's interesting about selling to home gardeners is that they blame themselves first. So if you sell them bad seed, it might take them a while for them to catch on. Whereas if you sell to, mark, to farmers, they blame you first, even if they have made a mistake. Um, but nonetheless, it's just easier to sell good seed, and that's more profitable down the line. So your seed packet itself has a bunch of costs associated with that. Um, you have to know what your marketing is going to be. Um, are you dealing with mail order? Are you dealing with websites, racks, events? A big thing is, do you want to have a print catalog? And this is a huge cost. Um, a lot of people it caught, wind up spending three to $5,000 on a print catalog. And on a small seed company, that's a lot of pack. It's the equivalent of a lot of packets. But, you know, as a gardener and as a farmer, isn't there anything greater than leafing through a seed catalog? And so these are the clients that you're looking for. So to choose to only go online, is a big, you know, it's, it's a big impact on your potential sales. Um, you should also think about your mailing list. Do you have a newsletter and that kind of thing? So your marketing outlets are an important thought. And so that's a whole other cost. You know, there's the cost of filling the orders. And it takes longer than you think. You know, you've got to print them out. You've got to run them through, get stamps on them, run them to the post office or, or somewhere. Or... Um, if you're going to events, I call it events. It could be a farmer's market. It could be a city Saturday or, or Sunday. You know, there's the actual cost of the events you're going to. There's the time to travel. You know, there's a the cost of gas and other vehicle wear. What are you going to eat there? Do you bring your own lunch? Or are you going to eat out? Um, these are all costs that come into play. And if you're going to deal with seed racks, there's a lot of management. And, um, you know, you have to, a lot of back and forth between the people to figure out what they want to, what they want to, to purchase. Filling a seed rack order, you know, if you fill, it has like 400 packets on it, that's a fantastic sale, but it's still 400 packets that you have to come, get together and either physically deliver or mail out. And then there's also follow-up that has to go into that of, to see, you know, whether things are selling or not, if they want to reorder. Um, if you have any kind, kind of consignment system, how they get the seed back, chasing down checks if they haven't paid you up front. So there's a lot of work that goes into that too. So um, a ton of work here. And then there's overhead, which uh, is all kinds of things. The biggest thing is where are you doing this work? So this is uh, one of our first seed offices. And um, 
Our, you know, during the peak seed season, our whole house looked, we lived in an apartment building, and everything had seeds on it in January, February. Um, after a bit of time, you know, we got a little bit more professional. We had a nice pole room, and things were consolidated to one room most of the time. Um, this last fall, we bought a 60-foot long job site trailer, so our seed business has moved out of our house into there, which has been fantastic. Um, but this thing cost 20,000 bucks, you know, for the, to, to set up and get electricity and all that too. So it is an investment. Now, over 10 years, that's a $2,000 investment a year, and it's, it's not very much. But for cash flow, spending 20,000 bucks in one shot, if you don't have that lying around, it's a big expense. Um, so, so that's probably the biggest expense is where you're going to do the work. Um, and some other expenses are, you know, your business development. Um, with vegetables, you know, maybe you set up a Facebook page, maybe a website, maybe not a website. You go to market and you have a handwritten blackboard, and you can do all right. Um, branding might help there too, but with a, with, a, with a seed business, you have a lot more of your image development you have to do um, to, 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 to promote yourself. Um, you need a seed room, as I mentioned, and that can also include a lot of shelvings and that kind of stuff. And then there's all kinds of office expenses. And, you know, I've kind of kept these numbers on the lower side because you can do this on the cheap. And some people are running seed businesses with not a lot of sales, but keeping the expenses really low, and it makes sense. But, you know, there's all kinds of other overhead that comes in. You know, your bookkeeping, all kinds of membership dues, bank fees. And that's one place that, in our case, so we have a 450000 or we have a $300,000 um, vegetable business. Having a $60,000 seed business as just part of that winds up that you know, this overhead is split over a much bigger enterprise, and the part allocated to the seeds is much smaller. Now, if we just had a $60,000 seed business, we, some of these fees might be lower, but some of the fees still might be the same size, and it winds up things being a, lot, a little bit more expensive. Um, so you gotta, you, the, the, the numbers make a real difference. So kind of summing it up, um, this is you know, the packet cost, the market cost, and the overhead. The number of hours that I've put in to take it. So it's about $9,000 of labor costs, about $10,000 of product cost to make about $20,000 you know, of expense cost. And just to remind, the seed production is accounted in that $4,000 or so of actual seed that's being packed up. Now, in terms of income, so let's say you have 15,000 packets. Maybe you sell 7,000 at three bucks. Uh, online, you get $21,000. You're selling seed racks, so it's at a, at a lower price, another $10,000, but you're not going to sell all the seed. I mean, you're very likely not going to. So here you have another 3,000 packs that might have been packed up that are unaccounted for. So this winds up with $31,000, um, which is, you know, still a, still a decent amount of money. And um, if you, so your $31,000 minus your expenses, you have $11,000 of profit, which, which is interesting. Um, and so this is net profit. There's about $8,000 in labor, which could be you. And in that case, you're making $20,000, um, which is interesting, but it's also about 700 hours through the winter that you've done this. So this is not a no-work job. It's if you're going into a retail seed business and you are producing the seed yourself, especially if you're a vegetable farm, you're creating a whole winter employment for yourself, which, you know, some of us depending on what climate you're li you live in, it's nice to have a more slower winter. Um, and here you're jumping into a whole lot more work. And, um, and I think that the picture I'm painting here is more of the optimistic pictures. Um, just like any budget, you can raise expenses way higher than, uh, than that. So um, I usually go into these talks trying to convince you not to run a seed business. <laughs> but if you do want to join the club, that's fantastic. <laughs> I, seed is a really important thing. We haven't gone to any of the value of seed, but it's, it's a foundation of farming. Um, kind of, you can also look at it a little bit in the cost to produce one, a packet. So, you know, there's the cost of the actual seed in there. So about 30 cents of seed, and that's an average, right? Some might be more, some might be lower. The packet cost, the cost to put in, the labor in, and then the overhead. And so on our farm, it costs us about a buck to produce a packet of seed. And there is labor in there, right? So, you know, it's paying people to do it. So if we sell seed at about $1.75 on average through our rack, minus that packet cost, it's about $0.75 cents that can go to marketing costs, and that's profit. 
through our web stores or events, we sell it at 350. So there's an additional buck 75 that we can go for marketing and profit. So these are kind of just, you know, another way to look at the same numbers. And you know, this there is definitely potential here. But what you really see is the more seed packets you sell, the more your some of your costs, especially your over casts, are gonna are gonna be reduced. You know, the cost of seed, the packet, and the labor, well, these two are going to be there. You know, they're pretty hard to avoid. The labor one, with efficiency, it can be reduced. The overhead one, that's reduced by selling a lot more packets. And that can involve a lot more investing in, in a better web store, better marketing, and better time. Um, but in the end, it might be worth it. Um, and I would say it's really important to control the seed cost. I don't like to see more than 50 cents of seed going into a seed packet. Um, there are some items that are popular that we might put more than 50 cents per seed in a seed packet. We're not putting them on seed racks. You know, We have them there because our clients want them. And there are some seeds that it might be like 5 cents per seed. And that's, you know, that's awesome. Um, and it kind of helps balance out some of the more expensive things. But like with any crop, the more you can go for the more profitable stuff, the more of the impact it's going to have on your, on your bottom line. So. Um, just as a reflection, going back, you can produce $5,000 of seed on a small area, and you can put it in 10,000 packets and spend all winter selling it and make some money. Or you can take, produce $5,000 of seed. In the, fall, in the fall, you put it in five boxes and you ship it out to your seed companies, and then you're dealt with. So this is probably not going to be enough to live on for most people. So this is something that be picking backing off of another kind of operation, or you have another source of employment that's not agriculture. This can be in a picture where you're only working off of your farm. So you got to kind of choose how it fits in with all your other decisions. So um, now, one thing I would say is um, this is a lot of work. It can be done. It's a lot of work. There's a lot of seed companies out there, though, and there's not a ton of local organic seed. Well, actually, you know, in California, in Oregon, and Washington, there is a ton of local organic seed. But where we are, there's not a ton of local organic seed. And it's something that there is a need for it. And um, if looking at the top number is scary and makes you not want to grow seed, I think you should consider the bottom one. And maybe seed doesn't work on your farm, but for a lot of people, that bottom number can work on your farm. And, um, and so the next step is, how do you sell that seed? So you need to build relationships with seed companies. And this kind of goes back to when I was talking, you know, as a seed company, when you sell to a client, you buy seed, these buy seed about once a year from you. The seed company buys seed from you about once a year. So generally it means you're starting out with a couple varieties and you're growing, you know, a little bit of seed from them and maybe they're buying $500 or $600 of seed from you in the first year. And if that goes well, they increase it the next year. And over time, maybe two, three years, you can get much more interesting. Now, if you've been growing seed for a lot of other people and you start growing for a new seed company, they might be happy to start off at a, at a much higher amount, but that's because you've already built that credibility in a certain population. Um, and so a couple questions that are, always, like if you're approaching it, so it's as simple, the first step is as simple as sending an email to a seed company or approaching a seed company at a trade show or at a conference and saying, I'd like to grow seed for you. <laughs> and the two questions that people want to know as a seed company is, what kind of experience do you have saving seed? And if I sell organic seed, I want to know if you're certified organic or not. Um, and it's good to get that out of the way right at the beginning. Um, you can still talk about seeds, but maybe it's not, a, maybe it's not a, a commercial transaction. And not all seed companies are interested in certified organic seed. Um, so that, that might not be a deal breaker for some people. The next thing is what most seed people who come to ask to grow seed for us, because we do have contract growers, the first question they ask is, what do we need? And definitely, we do... Um, you know, we, we have a lot of different varieties. We produce most of our stock seed that we have people grow out. So we can say maybe we need some tomatoes or some brassicas or, or whatever um, for them to grow out. And we, and, we, and we will, that's a good place to start. We'll send you a small amount of seed. You grow that out, send it back. Rarely will we have one person who's new reliant, the whole, reliant on a whole variety or whole variety relying on that person. But what I love to ask back is, what do you have to offer? What do you like to grow? And I would much prefer that you grow seed for me of something that you love and that you're good at. 
And that might take time to develop what that's good at is. But the thing that you love is the varieties that you're using on your farm or your garden is, you know, I definitely want to maintain a supply of the varieties that are stables in our, in our, in our, in our, in our catalog. But if there's a variety that you love and that you're going to be growing for the next 20 years, well then, I would love to have that in, our, in, 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 in my catalog because I know it's going to be around. And also, I know that if you care about it, you're going to keep selecting and maintaining it. And that variety will probably be much better in 10 years than it is right now. And in 20 years, even better. And so, um, so that is a real value to me when I find people who do have, have varieties. And, you know, and it, it could be something that they bred on farm, but it could also just be some squash that they bought from Johnny's and they like, and they've been growing it out for 10 years since then, or even a couple of years. And that's a really important step because ultimately what makes seed, seed saving interesting is when there's a niche on your farm for that seed. And if your farm relies on that seed, there's a value for you to grow it. And it's when we have that value that we become seed stewards. And it's not just trying something one year and trying something another year. And it's just, you know, it's in a large system, having these seeds become sort of linchpins to our, to our operation is, is what seed growers, what we need in sort of an agricultural community. And it kind of creates bioregional varieties down the time. And um, so independent of being a seed company, that's what I want to see on small farms, is people finding some varieties that, that, that works for them and that they start to produce. And that right now, there are a lot of really great seed companies out there. And getting good seed is not hard. But we live in a world with a lot of abundant resources right now and a really fantastic political climate, though it doesn't feel that way all the time. And things change. And um, 50 years ago, most gardeners and farmers knew how to save seed at least a bit. And nowadays, most people are intimidating by that. And it's not that hard. Sure, it's, it's, it's fantastic. There's a lot of skill that goes into it, but you can learn how to do it. And if we don't learn how to do that and learn how to be seed stewards and learn how to incorporate that in our farms, when we need those skills, they might not be there. And that's why, sure, it's, it can be a great, fantastic economic stream, but it's also a really important part of sustainability. So, on that note, I will say thank you very much. And um, if you want to find out more about us, we have a website, felmtolnasal.qc.ca. It's both in English and in French. And I blog about seed at goingtoseed.wordpress.com. Um, there's a, quite a bit of an archive. I haven't been writing a lot lately, but there's some fantastic older articles. And uh, a lot of the numbers that are in here, I'm planning on writing more about them. So yeah, so thank you very much. Question for you, uh, how long do seeds last? That depends on the variety. Um, and so something like leeks, onions, parsnips are known to last about a year, though some, some lots might last two or three years. Verily for parsnips, but on your leeks. Something like tomatoes, we have nine-year-old tomato seed that's still good. Um, so I would say a lot of stuff is three to five years. And there are a lot of resources, like the, the, the seed books I mentioned earlier have that, have that information. Um, we tend to grow out enough for a three-year supply when we grow it. So we'll grow a different variety every year for three years and kind of rotate through that. And um, what I kind of hope to do is sell that seed in one to two years. But, uh, but if I, and then figure out, a way to, figure out a way to grow it. Yeah. Dan, um, thanks, that was amazing, man. Um, I've got a lot of questions for you. <laughs> Probably ask when we have some beers or something. But uh, for now, I, I just wanted to comment that it really seems like, you know, you're talking about we could, you could potentially increase your margin by 50% if, if, if the labor and the uh, marketing and things like that could be improved. It seems like there's so much room for innovation with some of the small like DIY tech we see with 3D printing and stuff like that, with some automation, where you know, like uh, almost like those those um, seed vacuums that yeah. can hack. You know, do, do you really, do you see a lot of that on the horizon and like a lot of potential in that? Um. I visit a lot of seed companies, and it's interesting to see, you know, so, like Fedco packs all their seed by hand, and they pack a lot of seed. And High Mowing has this huge seed machine that can pack out, like, I don't know, thousands of packs uh, an hour. Um, so for the packing, um, for, the, for small lot sizes of a couple hundred packs, it's kind of, you know, when we're talking about seed cleaning, um, a lot of people think about they want to invest in big seed cleaning equipment. But you know, most of what we use is 
bins to harvest into, we bring it into a greenhouse, we dry things out on tarps, we stomp on things or drive on them with a tractor, then we use screens and we use winnow, we fan it, we fan it. We have some high-tech stuff, but screening and winnowing can do so much. And there's people I know who are growing seven to 10 acres of seed that are using those technologies. And what happens when you start to use commercial seed cleaning equipment is after the lot's cleaned, you gotta clean the machine. And sometimes it takes longer to clean the machine than it does to clean the seed. And, and that can make, you know, if you're growing a lot of seed, it might make sense. But for the kind of scales that we're at, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And so, so, for, so, so for packing, I was gonna, packing is kind of similar. If you have a small lot run, the changing of different parameters or setting stuff up can slow you down. But if you can pack it, two or 300 packs an hour, that's not your weakest point. It's, um, sure, reducing that cost is interesting, but it's not, it's not, your, it's not your weakest point. Having, selling more packs will have a bigger impact on your bottom line. And then in that case, you know, you are making more money. Um, but I think that DIY goes a long way with, with, with the seed world. And, you know, I know seed companies that are on the small side that have all their, they all have pictures on their packets. And you can do that with the printers that we have. And some of them look pretty good. Um, and you can, you can do all kinds of things with the branding and running the operation that make it look a lot slicker. Um, the, with the packing, I, th I think there's a certain scale you have to get to before it, um, and I, maybe I should say to pack, what we do is, um, so we sell by weight as opposed to by seed count, and so we do have scales where we can weigh out like 0.1 grams or 2 grams, but we have a bunch of different seed scoops, and so we'll, see, we'll calibrate what scoop fits that amount, so we'll do 10 or 20 scoops see, you know, on average what that is, is that the right target weight, and then we'll pack out a couple hundred packs at that. So scooping goes a long way. And then, in our case, we use a glue stick and we seal it. There are some that you can just press. Um, so that, you know, so that is already more high tech than just weighing out each packet. I would say, on a technology level, one of, we've, so we've been printing our packets for a couple years now, um, I just switched printers, and it's four times faster. And whereas it used to spend, take me all day to get a couple, a couple thousand packets printed, and you know I got it was a cheap print, it was a cheap printer that did a good quality, but it took forever. And I got this new printer, and I thought I was going to get three printers to maintain our production line. And that new printer, I could do what would take me all day in about an hour and a half, and it's been the best thing about this winter. So there, it's and, and it was on sale, you know, um, cost 150 bucks, you know, and. So technology can make a difference. Um, yeah, Chris. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how your in, in the field your seed production has changed over the years. So you were a vegetable farm, you started integrating seed into that, and now my impression is your seed production is separate from your vegetable yeah. farm. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how that's changed? And so, your crop planning around that? Um, so we grow about a three. So we have about seven acres of cash crop. Of that seven acres, about three quarters of an acre is seed production, and. Um, I think some of the, at this point, early on, we started separating our seed fields from our market garden fields for most of our crops. And there's a few reasons for that. One of them is seed crops are on the ground so much longer than a market garden. So if you have tat soy that you're going to grow as a salad mix in four weeks, you know, and then you have the same tat soy that's going to produce seed in August, it's just a world of difference the time that it's in the field. And so... That can be a problem if you want to incorporate, if you want to do a cover crop, if you want to double crop, that's, that, salad, that, that, that crop can be in the way. Um, also, irrigation needs are different. When a seed crop is being established, you do need to irrigate. But once it starts to go to flower, you probably want to get water off of it. And, or maybe you do drip tape. Um, and especially once it starts to dry down, like water is the worst thing ever. And um, so, um, so it just doesn't make sense to have something that's over, under overhead sprinkler beside a seed crop. Um, and a last thing is that, and, and you know, you, there are ways around some of that. Um, but another thing is a seed crop, you can't harvest all the seed that's on it. Maybe you harvest three quarters of it. There's a certain amount that's going to shatter on the ground. And that seed becomes a weed seed. Now, you know, some of my germinate, you create a salad green out of it, but it can become a weed seed the next year. And 
Um, so we always follow a year of seed production with a year of cover crop. So after the seed crop is finished, we'll mow it, but we don't till it. We don't turn it under. We let whatever's in the surface be eaten by beetles and, um, and mice. And also, once there starts to rain more in the fall, things start to germinate. And maybe we get a, seed, a, a salad green cut off then. But, um, but, you know, most of the seed is eliminated at that point. And then the next spring, we'll turn it under and we'll sow a cover crop. We'll do a year of cover crop. We might, you know, turn in the soil a couple times. And that'll help flush out the weeds or the seeds in there, also weeds. And it winds up that in the next crop year, you won't see a lot of, of seeds. And having your seed crops in a separate area than vegetables kind of also reduces that. Now, if you are following a seed crop with squash or potatoes, you can get that pretty clean because you have a lot bigger spaces. But if you're following with carrots, it's going to be a nightmare. Um, so those are kind of some of the changes that, that have happened over the, over, over the seed business. In terms specifically of crop planning, um, you know, we'll talk about crop planning on Saturday. We do the same kind of crop planning with our seed, and it's a little bit different in the sense that we're also planning for like two or three years of seed, and it's kind of a projection towards the future. What is really nice about seed versus vegetable is that it's non-perishable to a certain extent. So if we don't sell something one week, we can still have it the next week. And sometimes if we don't sell something one year, you might have it the next year. So there's a little bit more of a, a fle flexibility there. Any more questions? Storing your seeds yep. uh, after you've harvested them. Do you keep it? What type of uh, container do you keep it? So, um, the important thing before you store seeds is that they're dry. And um, so, generally, the way to dry, dry seed might be to have it spread out on a screen or a table and have fans blowing on it, you know, for a couple of weeks to a month. And um, if seed is dry, you can have it in something that's hermetically sealed and there's no problem. If it's not dry and it's hermetically sealed, it's going to start to mold, and, uh, and that's, not a, that's not a good thing. Um, and um, so the way we store seed is often we'll put seed either in Ziploc bags or in maybe a glass jar, but often in a Ziploc bag that's then in a Rubbermaid bin. And so in, um, so one of the things, you always want to label your seeds because you want to make sure stuff, you know what, what each thing is. But um, so we'll label the outside of the bag, and then we'll take a craft envelope and we'll put it inside the bag with the information on it also. Um, it's just going to double check, but that craft envelope becomes a humidity meter. So if you take that craft envelope out and you cr crumple it and it crinkles, you know the seed is dry. But if it doesn't crinkle, the seed might be wet. And if that a little flap has sealed shut, you got a problem. <laughs> and um, so we tend to put in a Ziploc and then a Rubbermaid. Um, you know, Rodents are another thing you want to watch out for. So it's, you don't want to just have stuff in paper bags everywhere, though that might work if you're in a dry climate. Um, and packing up seed on a dry day or in a room that's a bit heated so it's, it's, it's dry air will mean that you don't have humidity stuck in there when, uh, when you pack it up. 